What is the difference between borderline personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder? Are they different? Does the borderline have empathy and the narcissist not have empathy? Are they two sides of the same coin? I'm going to tell you what is the same about these two seemingly different mental illnesses and what is actually different. And most importantly, I'm going to tell you how you appear to each of these mentally ill people, the borderline or the narcissist. Uh, my name is Mike and this is my channel, uh, The One Thing That Heals BPD and NPD Abuse. I've just come out with a book, How I Survived My Borderline Girlfriend. You can find it on Kindle and Amazon and it will be on Audible. You can find that at audiobooks.thunderwizard.com. All right, so let's get back to the subject here. Borderline versus narcissist, two sides of the same coin. There's a lot of confusion. What is the difference here? How is it you can have a borderline comorbid narcissist? How is that even possible? What is the role of empathy? Does the borderline have false empathy, but the narcissist have no empathy? Does the, does the borderline have actual empathy? Is a, is a narcissist capable of empathy? What is empathy? I'm gonna, we're going to cut through all the garbage and I'm going to get to you what actual practical, we can call it practical empathy. I think some uh, psychiatrists and psychologists have, have termed this coin functional empathy, which is a meaningless phrase. It's meaningless. You, I'm going to tell you right now there is empathy and there is a lack of empathy and it has little or nothing to do with how you feel. We'll get into that. So before I go any further, let me just say that um, the focus of this video is for the survivors of BPD and NPD abuse. And, you know, a lot of a lot of borderlines do watch my channel for whatever reason. I don't know, but you're welcome here. Let me just say that borderline personality disorder is a very serious, very serious mental illness. And I cannot imagine the daily moment by moment pain that the borderline goes through. I actually can not imagine it. But if I could snap my fingers and relieve the world of one illness, without a doubt, it would be BPD. Because how these people survive this pain is, you know, is amazing to me. Having said that, um, most borderlines, I mean, almost to, to a person, do not have any idea the effect that their symptoms have on other people. We'll get into that. So borderlines do, if they get into therapy, group therapy, the right therapy, and do all the homework and all that, I have come to the conclusion that if they spend at least 10 years working their tails off because they want to, they can manage their symptoms and have functional relationships. If you're one of those people, I'm not talking about you. And um, anyway, let's get back to it. The point of this video is to help those of you who, who have been damaged by these incredibly destructive relationships. You have, you have gone through very serious, serious abuse, far more serious than you may even realize. You are suffering from CPTSD. It will not go away. The reason it will not go away over time, even if you haven't seen your borderline or your narcissist, or even if you've been in a lot of therapy, the reason why your pain doesn't completely ever go away is because you are still in a trauma bond loop of uh, intermittent reinforcement. You never get out of that, no matter how much therapy you go to. Maybe we'll have time to talk about it. Maybe I'll make another video about it. But there is a cure, and I mean that. If you are not uh, if you do not suffer from a personality disorder, there is a cure for the pain of the abusive relationship. I talk about it in my book. All right. So the difference between borderline versus narcissist. So the argument that I get all the time from borderlines, of course, is that what you're describing is not BPD. I have BPD and what you're describing isn't BPD. You shouldn't be stigmatizing and giving out false information like that. Borderlines have empathy. What you're talking about is NPD. You're talking about somebody who obviously doesn't have any empathy. So your border, your, your girlfriend was border, was a narcissist. She wasn't a borderline. I have empathy. In fact, the empathy I have is so intense. I can barely keep myself together. Yeah, my apologies if I, if it sounds like I'm making fun of you. Uh, the 
The idea that the borderline has empathy and the narcissist does not have empathy can be answered in how they uh, how their pathology involves you, what your role is in um, helping them to regulate their emotions. That's what it's all about. Borderline the narcissist, their entire motivation is to regulate their dysregulated emotional internal state. So we need to understand that the way that a borderline is created and the way that a narcissist is created is virtually identical. The difference is in the, you know, the, the finished product. And so what I'm going to do for the sake of argument is we're going to talk about a feminine response versus a masculine response. I'm not talking about the actual sex of male versus female. I'm just talking about, generally speaking, please get out of the new speak. You know, I, I'm not going to get into all of the woke whatever. You can be whatever sexual, uh, uh, you know, you can, you can define yourself in whatever sexual way you want. I'm not attacking that. We're just talking in generalities. Feminine versus masculine in terms of how they interact with the environment. And again, this is, uh, I am aware that this is actually a stereotype, but it's here to explain how it functions. What I'm going to say is that the borderline functions from a more feminine interactive perspective, even if they are a male, and the narcissist functions from a more alpha male interactive perspective, even if they're a female. There's plenty of female narcissists out there as well. And of course, as you know, there are people that have that are comorbid. So if these two borderline versus narcissist are so completely different, how is it that you have this comorbidity? It's because it's actually a spectrum. Now, most people, when you talk about a spectrum, like your typical uh, uh, super empath, on YouTube will say that there's a spectrum, that on one end of the spectrum is the super empath and on the other end of the spectrum is the narcissist. If we actually apply that spectrum to borderline versus narcissist, I'm in complete agreement with them. But what it means is that those people who identify as super empaths are actually borderlines. So yes, borderline versus narcissist is a spectrum and if you're with a borderline or a narcissist or somebody who is almost certainly comorbid, they are somewhere on this spectrum of how they seek to, to modify their dysregulated emotions. It is a strategy that they, you know, for whatever reason came up with as infants. So let's first talk about the extreme end seemingly, because actually if we understand it's two sides of the same coin, it isn't a, a gradation of one is less than the other. Let's get rid of that nonsense altogether. A extreme borderline who is untreated and is undiagnosed and is unaware is just as incredibly destructive as a narcissist. I don't care if they're a quiet borderline and they only go inward. Just for a second, let me di let me just divert here for a second. You know, one of the arguments that borderlines will make is that you know, we're not all the same, you know, and I've never abused anybody. I have BPD and what happens is is that I rage at myself and I I've never I've never abused anybody. Well, the definition of abuse for that borderline is they, they're going to say, I've never yelled at anybody, I've never punched anybody, I've never slashed their tires, I don't call them names. Then they'll say, but I, I, I isolate, I go inward. Well, the fact of the matter is, I know because I've been on both sides of these experiences with various different borderlines in my life, I can tell you that the end result of a borderline ghosting you and a borderline screaming in your face, the actual abuse that happens, the damage that happens is identical once the dust clears. 
It has the exact same feeling. It is the exact same constitution. It is narcissistic abuse. It is accomplishing the exact same goal in devaluing you. The fact that one is violent, one is uh, big and boisterous, and one isn't, is meaningless. So all of you quiet borderlines out there thinking I'm not as bad as the other ones, no. That can be even worse, if I'm being honest with you. Sometimes at least, you know, you're getting yelled at, at least you're, you know, you're getting some attention. But when somebody ghosts you, disappears on you, ghosts you, disappears on you, and sleeps with your asshole cousin in Vegas, that can be even more devaluing and painful than if somebody's standing there yelling at you, punching you in the face. So, let's get rid of that nonsense uh, right off the bat. There is no difference in quality of narcissistic abuse. The end result is always the same. It feels exactly the same. If you take two people, one person who's been um, with a quiet borderline for five years, and you talk to somebody who's been with a full-blown NPD who's, you know, beat them up and slashed their tires and, you know, everything like that. When you simply listen to them talk about the feelings that they have, the quality will be identical. What is the end result of that? The abuse is the same. There is no difference. Why is that? Because it's two sides of the same coin. It's a different expression of the same internal, fundamental mental illness, just a different expression. I'm using the, uh, I'm using the symbolism of masculine versus feminine. So let's get into that. So let's start with a narcissist on the ex supposed extreme end. The narcissist. Uh, the narcissist, uh, what they do as an infant, because they were not mirrored back to as a child. They were not loved. They might have been extremely abused, but at the very least they were neglected and they were left alone to create their own identity, which an infant cannot do on its own. So the end result is that the infant was forced to create their own identity instead of creating it in cooperation with their parent mirroring back to them who they are. So uh, when, the, when the narcissist created their identity, they used the only information that they had, which was their projection onto their mother and father, which is, my parents are God. So an infant doesn't, can't see individuals, doesn't see complexity. There's just this God that provides literally everything and in reality provides their survival. As I've said many times before, it's been proven over hundreds of years of experimentation that if you deny an infant intimacy, love, and touch, but you feed them and clothe them and wipe their ass, they will die from lack of interaction long before they die from any other illness, anything else. So a narcissist is somebody who almost died as an infant, got just enough interaction so that they didn't die, but did, was not given enough interaction to create a self, an identity. So in order to survive, they create their own identity and they use the only information they have, which is their infantile projection onto their narcissist parent. And so they come up with literally the biblical Jehovah. Uh, a jealous God that demands perfection, and if you don't give them perfection, then you will be eternally tormented. You won't be killed. You will be eternally tormented in hell. This is what borderlines and narcissists live through their entire lives. That's why they're such horrible mental illnesses. And um, so the narcissist in the midst of that pain creates their own identity, which is a Jehovah-like um, perfect God and they fantasize about what it's like for that infinite God-like being that wherever this being goes everybody bows to them everybody worships them they get everything that they want they are abs you know it, it's a childish immature projection of their 
narcissistic parents because that's how they see their narcissistic parents as these all powerful beings that have the ability to love to give life to kill to give pleasure to give pain to give food to give warmth to give comfort to do everything for me but they're not and in that hell where your god is not interacting with you you create a false god which is your internal fantasy now the borderline excuse me the narcissist then completely farms out their identity to this non-existent internal fantasy of themselves now god being god we can use jehovah as a very good example jehovah created the universe and then he decided to create man because he was alone and he wanted to interact with somebody so he made man in his own image, which was really meant Jehovah's lonely. He wanted to talk to somebody. But being Jehovah, he didn't want an equal. He wanted them to, you know, worship him. So he created an Eden. I mean, again, it's what we're talking about. The biblical Jehovah is really just the perfect example of the narcissistic pathology. It's perfect. They create, he creates this Eden where there is no sin. Sin means imperfection. So he creates this place where there is no imperfection. And in that place where there is no imperfection, he creates his own image, human beings. And these human beings are naked, meaning they don't have any boundaries. They don't have any self-awareness because the sin that uh, in the Bible that you know, Jehovah says to Adam and Eve is that, you know, why are you wearing fig leaves? Well, we became aware we were naked. Who told you you were naked? That was their sin. Their sin was becoming aware that they didn't have any boundaries. <laughs> that was their sin. I mean, you know, I'm not making it up. You can read the Bible yourself. So they don't have any boundaries. And that is, the, that is not just a tiny mistake. That infuriates Jehovah to such a degree that he kicks them out. He discards them. He kicks them out of Eden. All right. We won't get into the symbolism of the serpent. That's a whole other subject that I talk about on my other channel. Um, so, so we're still talking about how the narcissist creates their internal environment. Their internal environment is uh, they create this perfect Eden where there is no sin and they are the almighty God that walks through the forest. And in their fantasy, internal fantasy, that they need in order to survive. Bear in mind, this is for their survival. If this fantasy stopped working, they would die. Literally, it would kill them. The pain would kill them. So they need to keep this internal fantasy going all the time. And so this internal fantasy is going where this God lives there and they farm out to this God that they've created. The, their own regulation and they get it from in the fantasy this god going down and everybody worshiping him and they live in this eden and it's perfect and you you love me and i deign to love you and all of that all right so that's what is going on in the adult narcissist they have this internal childish immature fantasy of a perfect eden and they farm out their identity to this created almighty God, which is not them, but they pretend that it is. And this almighty internal fantasy of themselves then presents themselves to the world, and this is the who you interact with. Now, the whole goal of this is to regulate their dysregulated feelings. It doesn't work. Why? Because it's not real. It's a fantasy, and a fantasy isn't going to work. The only thing that's going to work is actual fulfilling interactions on an actual real level. They don't know how to do that. So they, their internal fantasy is what is designed in their mind. They believe if everything goes according to their internal fantasy of, you know, my my internal God being worshipped perfectly, then I will be okay. And so it doesn't. So what they do is they look around in the external world for somebody to help fill in, 
So the way that I, I describe it is, imagine in their internal fantasy, they have all of the characters that they need. And as long as all of these characters are worshiping their internal deity of themselves perfectly, then, um, sorry, it's very dry in here. Cold winter, that's why I'm so itchy. So in their internal fantasy, they have all of the characters. They've planned them out. They've written the script. The characters are there. They know if the script fall, goes according to plan, they will be fulfilled. The problem is, is that all they have basically is just a bunch of empty costumes with no actors in them. So they've got the costumes walking around and trying to do, and it doesn't work. It frustrates them because there's no reality to it. They need to get some actors who will go into their internal fantasy, put on the makeup, wear the costumes, and follow the script. They want to, they want to breathe life into their fantasy. So what they do is, in the external world, which to them is not real, the reason why they don't have any empathy is because to them the external world is not real. It's a dream world that they don't understand. They don't, they, they, they don't see anybody as being an independent being. This is the, you understand, this is the, the mind of a very tortured infant they ha that hasn't been alive long enough, that doesn't have enough experience to know that other people have independent realities. That's why they don't have any empathy. It's just we're talking about very damaged, very infantile people. That's why, you know, wasting time thinking about them as being evil geniuses is an absolute waste of time. Because to be an evil genius, you know, that's a whole other thing. They're not evil geniuses. They're warped, uh, damaged, tiny, little, immature infants who are doing their best to try and keep from dying from the pain that they live in on a daily, moment-to-moment -moment basis. And unfortunately, once that infantile immature scenario becomes an adult, they become extremely, uh, extremely toxic and extremely destructive and in some cases extremely, extremely dangerous. So now you understand. So what they see is they're bumbling around. Again, they're not evil geniuses. They are bumbling around in the external world. This is why all narcissists get caught and end up going to jail. Almost all, I mean, Nexium, perfect example. The guy now, you know, had everything. If he had been just, you know, 2% smarter, he'd still be, you know, doing great. Because he's a narcissist and bumbling around reality, he's now going to spend the rest of his life in jail. So they bumble around in the external world and they're looking for actors. They're looking for uh they're looking for action figures whom they can bring into their internal fantasy and like an action figure, put on the right costume and paint it and make it so that it, you know, now, okay, you're going to play the role of, you know, G.I. Joe or whatever it is. Action. And your job is to know the script and know who you're supposed to be in their internal fantasy and then be that. And in their mind, they believe that if they can, if they can pull you, the stick figure, to, that, to them you're just a stick figure walking around. You're a stick figure and you have no value to them because you're not, you're not wearing their costume and playing the role they need you to play in their fantasy. So once they do whatever they do, their love bombing, their manipulation, or whatever, to you know, bring you into their shared fantasy. It, it, it's a shared fantasy when you buy into it. It's their fantasy, and then they want to infect you with it, and then it becomes a shared fantasy. As the codependent, then you become unconsciously entrained to go like a, like a dog. Train me, tell me what to do, and I'll do it so that you will be okay, and then you'll love me. So, by the way, make it, let's be very clear. If you're watching this channel because you relate to what I'm saying, being on the victim side of this, it's because you are damaged also. If you didn't have a switch in there to get flipped to play this role, you wouldn't. 
They, number one, the, the narcissist can see who is available and who wants to, to uh, be part of a shared fantasy and who doesn't have that. And for those that don't have that ability, they literally don't see them. You just sort of, you know, pop out of this, this nebulous nothingness and they can see you and they go, ah, there's a stick figure that wants to be in my fantasy. Let me go explain to them what their job is. So they go and they recruit you. And once you accept the shared fantasy, that's like signing the, the agreement to be in the movie. You're now, your job is to be an actor in their movie. You get pulled into their internal fantasy. It doesn't work. Why? Because you are an independent, two reasons. Number one, the internal fantasy will never give them fulfillment. So even if you do everything exactly the way they want, they will get furious at you as the almighty God and they will throw you in hell the same way God throws you know, human beings into hell simply for being alive. You're not perfect, meaning you did not, fantas you did not fulfill their fantasy, even though you did actually everything. Of course, they'll blame it on you. They'll discard you, and then they'll keep looking for somebody else to, to put inside their little fantasy. So you get it? They internalize their fantasy. They believe their fantasy will, will heal them of all of their pain, and they recruit external objects, which are just stick figures walking around. They grab you, they pull you in, and try and put you inside their internal fantasy, make you wear the costume and the makeup, and uh, you know play out the script. That's how narcissists work. Now let's talk about the borderline. So the borderline, um, now, so you, the narcissist is more masculine because the narcissist, like, uh, like Jehovah, and there's a reason why Jehovah is a male. The reason why Jehovah is a male is because he's the, you know, the alpha who controls everybody. So the alpha male is somebody we associate with somebody who controls things. You do this, you do that, follow my orders and everything will be all right. It's the alpha male. So that's why I say the narcissist is operating from a masculine perspective because it wants to just control everybody. And as long as everybody does what they're supposed to do, everything's going to be okay. Borderline is operating, again, on a spectrum, the, on the far other end of the spectrum, the borderline is operating from a more feminine perspective. And the feminine perspective is instead of internalizing their fantasy, they externalize their fantasy. What that means is objective reality becomes their canvas upon which they project their fantasy. The difference between the borderline and the narcissist is the narcissist wants complete control, wants to direct the show. They're going to recruit you, pull you into the internal, to the movie, and then they're going to direct everything that you do. I, you know, as I've been an actor before, so it's like, listen, it doesn't matter what you think. Here's the script. Do your job. Uh, hit the lights, you know, hit your mark and say your line. And um, let the script do its work. That's, you know, a lot of directors will, will work that way. Uh, the borderline is more of, a, of an artist who wants to express externally onto a, the canvas of objective reality, the same thing, her, her fantasy. So she externalizes her internal fantasy. She has the exact same end goal as the narcissist, which is regulate my incredibly dysregulated emotions. I, if, if you're borderline, uh, you are um, an infantile, extremely immature, infantile little, little being in an adult body. And you want the same thing. You see your happiness will be given to you by God. God will give you everything. So you want to be the supplicant. You want to worship. Whereas the, the narcissist wants to be God and wants to be worshipped. You want to worship God so that God will give you everything. It's the ultimate codependent. So you want God to give you everything. So it's more of a passive thing. So what, what the borderline does is the borderline, again, in external reality, does not 
see human beings as having their own individual identity. They don't. They are stick figures walking around. So in both cases, for the narcissist, external reality is this unreal dream with a bunch of stick figures walking around that he grabs onto and puts into his internal fantasy. The borderline sees external reality as this canvas, and there's a bunch of stick figures walking around that she projects outwardly onto. So she doesn't want to grab you and pull you into her internal fantasy. She does have a shared fantasy that she projects outward. Your job is then to be sort of hit by that outward projection and then be seduced into it. You get seduced into it and then she wants to be part of the show. And if everybody is playing their part externally, if the music is playing and everything, then she can relax and absorb into it. Now, the difference is she wants you to be the director. She wants you to be the director of the show. So she farms out the responsibility to regulate her emotions to you. Now, it's identical in that in both cases, the narcissist and the borderline want you to regulate their emotions. But the narcissist says, you can regulate my emotions as long as you do what I say. I know exactly what I want from you and what I want you to do. And if you do it, then I will control you and I will get what I want from you. You will regulate my emotions and make me happy. The borderline says, here's my fantasy. And they seduce you into their fantasy. This is why they say, I know you, you're the only one who truly sees me. Borderline say this. You're the only one that truly sees me. You're the only one that can help me. You are my knight in shining armor. You truly understand me. I love you. And what it's really, it's, it's the worship of the Almighty. They are farming out to you the ultimate control. They want you to become Jehovah, the all-loving God. This time they're going to turn Jehovah into an all-loving God who's going to love them and create an Eden. They both want an Eden. Narcissist is an internal Eden that they grab on and they make you a, an unwilling, well, you're a willing participant, but they take you hostage in, inside their fantasy. The borderline wants to uh, wants to seduce you into willingly take over the job of God. You are now going to direct the fantasy. You are going to give everything to her. My borderline, this is how my borderline said it to me. Very early on, and of course, you know, I'm, as you can tell, I'm kind of the alpha male type, right? So I fit into that, you know, and I'm also, you know, the son of a borderline myself. So I've got that codependent thing going on. So it's kind of perfect for her. So what she said to me was, whenever I'm in the presence of a strong alpha male, I feel good in their energy. When I'm inside their aura, I feel good. So then she went on to say, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that you're happy all the time. Because if you're happy all of the time, your happiness will surround me and I will be happy. And that is actually the perfect definition of her saying, I want you to regulate my dysregulated emotions. I can't do it. I want you to do it for me. In her fantasy, as long as I am playing the role of the benevolent God who is able to keep everything and with my energy, I ex my energy comes out of me, which surrounds her and then she is pacified her, you know, her, she's regulated and then she will worship me forever. Again, very childish, very, very infantile, what, what infants want to do with their, with their parents. They want to worship their parents and in exchange be given all the love. The narcissist wants to become God. The borderline wants, to, wants you to be God. So as great as that sounds, the same thing applies. For the borderline, the fantasy can't work because it's a fantasy. And you do not have any value. You don't have, you're not a person. So even though they are, you know, they, they are uh, worshiping you as a God, as a parent, 
even though that that feeds your codependent uh, narcissistic ego, your need as the as the codependent is you get your value by meeting somebody else's needs and then being loved. Um, the borderline is saying you will make me happy if you do what I want and then I will worship you. And you'll say, oh, as long as I can be what you want and get value and relevance in the world, tell me what the role is. And then, yes, please worship me and give me everything I want and give me all of the, the all of my needs met. But it can't work because it's a fantasy and you are, again, a stick figure. You're a stick figure walking around and like the narcissist, they can only see the stick figures that have a switch in them that says, I don't have any value unless I can make you happy. And they see that, they go, ah, and then they come to you. They project onto you, which is, if you think about it, it's a form of violence. They're not, they, they're not interested in seeing who you are. They don't want to get to know you. They want you to be this perfect, all-loving, all-powerful God who will meet all of their needs. They're not interested in you being an individual with your own desires. Your desire is just to be worshipped and be perfect and meet my needs. It's very childish. But in both cases, external reality is where all the stick figures walk around that don't have identities, that don't have any feelings, that don't have any real life. Okay, so you got the two. They're two sides of the same coin. One is more passive approach, but it's the same thing. I want my fantasy externalized and I want all everybody to play the part. And when you do that, I will feel happy. My emotions will be regulated and I will be a happy little infant. The narcissist, on the other hand, says, I've decided I'm going to become the parent. I'm going to become God. And you all need to come into my internal Eden fantasy, follow all the rules. And then my incredibly painful, dysregulated emotions will be under control and I will be OK. It's the same goal, two different expressions of the same basic problem, which is an infant who simply didn't get any attention or any love and they broke. And instead of dying, they created fantasy worlds. So I used to say that borderlines were failed narcissists. And in a sense, they are because they didn't internalize it. But actually, no, the, the borderline is, is just as intensely powerful and just as intensely um, delusional. It's the same delusion. It's just as powerful. The difference is we get into now when it comes to empathy, false empathy versus no empathy. So the reason why we experience the narcissist as not having any empathy is because they don't. Uh, they, they don't have any feelings for the stick figures walking around. And this external reality, which to them is this dream that they don't really understand, you're just a stick figure and they need you. They need the mobility of the stick figure to come into their fantasy and put on the costume and play out the role that I've designated for them to worship me as the almighty God. You're just a stick figure. You have no value to me. I don't have any empathy for you. You don't have, an, you don't have a life of your own. You don't have any value of your own. Again, very childish, very uh, immature. Borderline is exactly the same way, except that, except that what ends up happening is that the borderline takes a more feminine approach to it. And here's the difference between a masculine and feminine. Um, so, and again, it has nothing to do with sex. Please get, we're talking about stereotypes, archetypes. So the, ma the, the feminine says, the same thing. I want the universe to be uh, perfect and to be balanced. And in order for the universe to be perfect and balanced, people need to play their part. So what I'm going to do as the muse is I am going to reflect to you the perfection of what you can be. And I'm going to give you that, so, that inspiration so you can reach higher to be more than you are, perfect yourself, and then there, you know, the world is filled with beauty. This is why men, 
if we're talking about heterosexual relationships, especially you know going back in time, more traditional stuff. This is why men would get on their knees and say to the woman, you inspire me, I am going to bring the moon down to you. You make me feel like I can do anything. And then he goes off and becomes you know, the most successful, whatever he is, and then creates a family for them. And, them. and so she wants him, if she is able to mirror back to him his potential, to seduce him into the fantasy of who he can become, which is actually a very healing thing among healthy people, she is seeing, looking at him the same way a mother looks at a child, but she's looking at an adult going, who is this person? What are his goals in life? What are his desires? What are his, his true potential? What are his, his skills? And then she seduces him into a fantasy that is actually accurate, what he can grow into, the potential he can be. In fact, many men will say this about women. I said this about my, um, my uh, not my borderline, my um, soulmate who passed away. I said, what uh, she did for me is she made me believe that I could become uh, a better man. And I became the man that she saw in me to be. But again, she saw me lovingly. And of course, the more that I, I lived up to her fantasy of me, which is actually coming from me, the happier I was, the more fulfilled I was. So that's a, that's, that's a selfless way to do it. That's a healthy way. The borderline isn't healthy. The borderline is a warped, excuse me, it is a damaged infant who has an infantile, immature fantasy. They want the same thing the narcissist does, but they will try and seduce you into becoming their fantasy. And in their fantasy, you are not the hero who rises to his or her own actual potential that fulfills you and benefits and balances the universe. No, her fantasy is that she has a fantasy that you need to become God so that you can regulate her emotions. You have no value in and of yourself. Now, being the feminine counterpart of the narcissist, she is filled with a lot of maternal feelings for you. These are selfish feelings. And they're also um, conflated with her transference. She's transferring onto you the un, un resolved love she has for her mother and father. And those are very intense loving feelings, but they're purely selfish. They're infantile. She projects them onto you, conflates it with her desire to seduce you into being the fantasy of this almighty God that will regulate her feelings. And to you, it feels encouraging. It's love bombing. There's no feeling like it. I can tell you from personal experience. And this is, you know, I met like a soulmate who actually did all that and fulfilled me in all the ways. Unfortunately, she passed away. And then I met a borderline. And what the borderline gave me was far more. I mean, there was, it, of course, it was extremely destructive. And, you know, I, but in the beginning, you don't realize that you're being instrumentalized. The borderline does not see you. The borderline does not love you. The borderline sees you as a stick figure that they can project onto them selfishly. You're going to become God and then you are going to meet every single one of my needs just like God is supposed to do. That's your job. So now you understand when my borderline said, uh, I love masculine energy, strong masculine energy. I like to get inside of it. It calms me down and makes me feel good. So I'm going to do everything in my power to make you feel good so that you'll be happy. She wasn't interested in my happiness. She had this fantasy that if she could seduce me and, you know, inflate my ego, then, then my self-aggrandized ego would then expand, which would then she could farm out because she doesn't have an ego. She could farm out to me to do the job of regulating her emotions, which of course is impossible 
Nobody can regulate your emotions for you. Only you can regulate your emotions. So she has no choice but to get furious because you, you're not going to fix the pain. Same thing with the narcissist. They're going to get furious with all the little actors that have chosen to be in their, in, in their script, in their movie, because even if they do their parts perfectly, it doesn't make them feel good. And then they get furious and they destroy everybody and they start from scratch. Same thing with the borderline. Creates a fantasy. This time it's external. You're supposed to be God. You're supposed to be all powerful, all loving, all knowing. You're supposed to, to give them everything. Their obeisance to you empowers you even more so that you give them of your eternal power. It doesn't work. They become furious. And what do they do? They destroy the relationship, they discard you, and they look for another God to take the place. So the empathy, last thing we'll talk about empathy. Borderlines uh, will say that I have empathy, I'm not a narcissist. Well, I'm here to tell you that there's no difference. We're talking about, for me, we're talking about narcissistic personality disorder with two different expressions. One is a more masculine approach, one is a more feminine approach. But they both devalue, they both have no empathy for the other person, they do not see you as an individual, they do not care about your individuality. The difference is that the borderline believes that their love, like the ultimate feminine, you know, that their love will provoke you into becoming God. So they have these intense feelings that resemble empathy, you, tears, lots of love, uh, feelings of loving feelings. But here's the thing, empathy is not a feeling. Love is not a feeling. Empathy is an awareness that says, I empathize, I feel in, which is not a projection. You can project onto somebody, a little puppy or a kitten, oh, they're so cute and so lovable. Well, you're projecting your internal love. There's nothing wrong with it because as long as you have empathy while you project, it's fine. But if you don't have empathy, your projection, which is your narcissistic experience, tears coming down your face of how much love you have for them and I would die for this being, is coming from need and it's coming from transference and it's coming from projection because the moment that you stop having that squishy feeling what does a borderline do they drop you like a used candy wrapper empathy says i see that you are an individual i know that what is most important for you is i act in a way that is helpful to your individual functioning and health in the world regardless of how i feel now, it's great when you do have all those squishy projections, transferences, and all those, you know, empathetic feelings. That's great. But true empathy doesn't end when the feeling ends. With borderlines, they will say, I'm full of empathy. You're full of transference. You're full of projection. You're projecting onto somebody else the love you want them to have for you. And you have this uh, feeling you, you can... You know, you can feel the love coming out of you, but it's it's not because you're actually thinking to yourself, I want what's best for that person. When you're in a bad mood and you're not getting what you want and, and you're not, you know, having a good day, if you can still say the same loving things, do the same things, and then not be angry about it afterwards, then you can say you have true love and true, true empathy. Borderlines if they're untreated, undiagnosed, and or toxic, don't have this. They have empathy, which is again them um, trying to seduce you into a feeling so that you will play the part which will eventually make them happy. You know, while they're doing that, you know, uh, mothers are great at this. They're, mothers are great at, at, at um, you know, a, a making their kids feel good, making their husbands feel good. And they know that they're doing it for the benefit of the family and that makes them happy. Borderlines are selfish. They want their own needs met and they can't tell the difference. So they will cry and say, you don't understand. I am full of empathy, but it doesn't last. Bottom line is, if your squishy empathy love feelings do not last, 
And if you do not act identically when you're in a bad mood as when you are when it feels good, then it's not love and it's not empathy. Then it's objectification and it's incredibly abusive. I can tell you from personal experience, there is nothing more abusive than being led to believe that somebody really truly loves you and pours love on you and affection on you and gets you bonded to them and then discards you at the drop of a hat because they lost their feeling. There is nothing more abusive than that. And it doesn't matter if you're yelling and screaming at somebody when you do it. If you're a quiet borderline and you disappear, you ghost them, you kiss them and say, thank you, I've got to go, I love you, I'll talk to you soon. And then you disappear and go off to Vegas with somebody or crawl into bed for a month. It doesn't matter. It's the same as if somebody said, I love you, wait, no, I hate your guts, you're a worthless piece of crap, I'm going to slash your tires. The end result is exactly the same. All right? So... Hopefully that clears that up. Bottom line is, is that the narcissist internalizes their fantasy and then takes control and becomes the director, grabs you, takes you hostage and pulls you into, into their fantasy. The borderline externalizes her fantasy onto a canvas and then tries to paint onto you the colors that she wants in order for the fantasy to become real. In either case, you are nothing. You are just a stick figure for him or her to use so that you can regulate their emotions. You have no meaning other than that. If you want to heal from the pain, and if you're not a disordered person, you can actually reverse the insanity within you, the functional insanity of your codependence, and you can completely heal the pain. I mean that. And if you haven't completely healed your pain, it's because there's one thing you're not doing. Get my book, How I Survived My Borderline Girlfriend, which will explain some of this in more detail. And um, you will learn how to completely, once and for all, heal the pain, not only of that relationship, but it will also make you invulnerable to a narcissist or a borderline. But you have to heal first. I tell you how to do that in this book. How I Survived My Borderline Girlfriend. All right, that's it. I hope that was informational. I hope I got it all out. Thank you for watching it all the way to the end. See you guys soon.